in order to test if your uh, predictor your data you can build a simple not a simple graphical representation of uh, of this effect you simply plot y against x or x against y it does matter at all this is what you get and the slope of this distribution is exactly what you call the beta of the x uh, what we are going to see if there is absolutely no contribution it's also very easy to model uh, it's, ve it's very easy to show let's take just noise and plot it against x obviously there is no contribution of x of our experimental predictor into noise and there will be no slope let's type noise instead of y and let's look at the resulting figure you see totally random distribution no slope at all statistical significance is extremely low which is logical uh, but let's move towards analysis of the real data I don't know how uh, how much uh, are we able to cover today but this is what we can potentially can do there are two chapters of uh, the manual of SPM we can use uh, to to get some practice with with usage of SPM first chapter 31 face fMRI data this is for the first level mm -hmm analysis the SPM manual is located in SPM folder subfolder man you'll find it easily and you need to open it and to find chapter 31 for the first part what we are going to do in this chapter there will be functional images of one experiment at the input and after special pre-processing as you remember uh, reorientation, realignment uh, co-registration, segmentation normalization and smoothing you get pre-processed functional images you specify the model it will be totally different model much more complicated than the previous time or there can be several alternative models of how to to analyze the very same experiment and at the end you get statistical results and contrast images contrast and beta images I will uh, get to the difference between contrast and beta just a bit later actually contrast can be equivalent to beta in some cases all this is just for one individual but after the results of multiple subjects 
from the same experiment are used in chapter 32. This is where you take not the functional images, but the contrast images generated for each subject at the previous level. You use those contrast images for the second level analysis. And then you get again contrast images and statistical images, but already for the group, not for the individual. And those are very different approaches. Here what is used is the fixed effects statistics. And the results of this kind of analysis they are typically more sensitive, but they can be extrapolated just for this local case, just for this individual, not for the group in general. So those conclusions are very restricted. You cannot generalize based on your first level analysis. You can say that, okay, in this particular subject, yes, we say something. What happens in the group of the same subjects, in students or in humans in general, you don't know. But if you collect a representative group and you do second level analysis, this is where you can build some more broad conclusions. But before you need to do first level anyway, there is no way to go directly to the second level. First you analyze individual data, then you analyze group data. And this is the experiment that has been conducted. It is called two-factorial study because they specifically manipulated two independent factors. You can call those factors fame and repetition. The design is not terribly complicated. They show a face on the screen for half a second. Then it is replayed with, uh, replaced with checkerboard, which is visually stimulating but has nothing to do with face. This is the control condition or baseline condition. So there is always some sensory stimulation, some visual stimulation, but in some cases it is face. In other cases it is checkerboard just a part of it. Hopefully it is normalized for the luminance and uh, uh, other visual properties. Some faces, this is Ronald Reagan, they are well known. Some faces are not known at all. The number of known faces and unknown faces across experiment will be the same. It's just a brief sample so that you understand the structure. And each face, either known or not known, will be shown two times. First time, second time. Obviously with different interval. Or you can call it lag.
That is why this condition can be coded as F1, famous one. This condition is F2, famous two. And those two presentations are N1. But later those faces will, will appear once again and they will be called N2. Subjects uh, were asked to make judgments about how famous those faces are by key presses during this interval. Uh, the judgments are not the part of this model, though they can be. But this is what is the model. Two factors. Totally independent. You can represent it as a table. This is a faint factor. Subjects can be either non-famous or famous. And this is the presentation factor. Each image is presented either for the first time during the session or the second time. If there are in total 10 images for non-famous and 10 images for famous and each of them is shown two times, there will be 40 presentations because the design should be absolutely balanced. And this is how it looks. Non-famous first presentation. It is represented on the time scale as spikes. Those are presentations with different intervals. Non-famous. This is for non-famous but second presentation. And this is famous, but first presentation. This is famous, second presentation. And the timing of those presentations is stored in a separate variable which is given to us in the archive you hopefully downloaded from the SPM site. Uh, as a result of two model specifications you are going to get two different design matrices and uh, I will try to explain to you how to read those matrices how to understand what means what uh, when I started to work with SPM uh, those plots looked very, very unclear for me. Uh, I hope that this impression will be totally resolved after our practical course today. Let's make a small break.